from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working with students and families to improve college access and student success for a better West Virginia. Good evening and welcome to the Legislature Today from the Capitol Building in Charleston. I'm Andrea Lanham. A measure to eliminate funding for abortions under the state Medicaid program was subject of a public hearing this morning. We'll bring you excerpts later in the program. Also, an in-depth discussion on child sexual abuse in West Virginia. We'll be joined by the Executive Director of the West Virginia Child Advocacy Network. But first, Governor Jim Justice today announced the appointment of Dr. Michael Brummage as director of the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources Office of Drug Control Policy. Brummage most recently served as executive director of the Kanawha Charleston Health Department. The governor went on to say the DHHR will select a few counties for a kind of opioid fight pilot project. Eastern Panhandle. We don't have enough money to fight the battle on all fronts at all times right now. We're going to have to do everything we can to maintain and make things better statewide. But we've got to come up with a model that works. And so we're going to pick that county in the south. And in all honesty, the county in the south is probably going to be Wyoming County because that was my pick. And we're gonna pick a county in the Eastern Panhandle or the, North, or, or, the, or, or the North, and we're going to try to do everything we can to put together a playbook that solves the riddle there. And then let that in itself expand to other counties throughout our state, while at the same time, we're doing everything we possibly can to protect all of our counties in our state and do all the good that we can possibly do. But today, there is no humanly way that you can fight this on 55 fronts at the same time. As the halfway mark of the session nears, bipartisan efforts can begin to strain, but addressing child sexual abuse has garnered support from both sides of the aisle. Tonight, an in-depth discussion on child sexual abuse in West Virginia and the recommendations from a state task force. We begin with some background as Rebecca Turnbull reports. A task force studying child sex abuse in the state has reported its legislative recommendations to the Joint Committee on Education. The task force was created after the passage of House Bill 2527, otherwise known as Aaron Marin's Law, in 2015, making West Virginia the 20th state to adopt the child abuse prevention legislation. A 2014 West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources study found that nearly 1 in 10 children in the state have been sexually abused before the age of 18. That statistic has alarmed many legislators. I don't think there was a dry eye in the House when a few of the, the, the individuals were standing up to speak to this bill or this potential bill uh, when they were there. I just It was really very emotional for all of us. And I think that's what you'll find as we move forward, both in the committee and on the floor when we begin to speak to this legislation. It's going to be a very emotional issue. And when it's emotional, we all come together. That bipartisan effort started when the bill was passed in 2015 and has continued into this session. Lawmakers in both houses and on both sides of the aisle are working quickly to pass the recommended legislation. The goal is to begin reducing the number of children who experience sexual abuse in two ways, by training school employees to identify signs of abuse in students and by teaching students to recognize when they're in an abusive situation. However, legislators say it will take much more than the passage of the law to eliminate child sexual abuse. I do think there is a uh uh, a multifaceted approach that we need to take. Everything from education to enforcement, obviously improving our, our, you know, our economic climate here in West Virginia. Certainly, I believe this legislation uh, just is one additional step to you know, just really protecting the most vulnerable among us, our children. 
While safeguarding future generations from sexual abuse would be a victory in itself, child abuse experts say the legislation could help solve other issues as well. Traumatic experiences often turn children toward drug abuse and difficulty holding jobs. Advocates say this legislation gives thousands of kids across the state a much needed second chance. By reducing these adverse childhood experiences and preventing them from happening in the first place, we just change that trajectory. We realize the vision that we do care for one another and we're helping each other before problems arise so that uh, children can you know, grow up healthy, strong, ready to learn, and then have that life that they deserve. Currently, West Virginia is one of 31 states in the nation to have implemented Aaron Marin's law, but legislators say they are hoping to lead the way for surrounding states to pass similar laws. For the legislature today, I'm Rebecca Turnbull at the Capitol. Joining me is a member of the West Virginia State Task Force on Child Sexual Abuse, Emily Chittenden Laird, Executive Director of the West Virginia Child Advocacy Network. Director Laird, thank you for joining me this evening. I'm glad to be here. So the video report we just watched mentioned Aaron Marin's law, the original legislation in 2015 that called for the creation of this task force. Can you tell us who Aaron Marin is? and the history with this law? Sure. Um, well, Erin Moran, while we'd love for her to be a West Virginian, she's not, we could adopt her, um, but she's a survivor of child sexual abuse who actually um, uh, found her path to healing eventually um, by telling what had happened to her and, and going through a, a children's advocacy center after she made that disclosure. That's, I work with children's advocacy centers. Um, but she became very passionate as an adult because she, she says, you know, when she was in school growing up, she had drills for, um, you know, what to do in case of a fire, what to do in case of a tornado. And yet no one ever told her how do I get away if I'm being sexually abused? Who do I tell if I'm being sexually abused? And, and what's happening to me? And so her advocacy continued um, through the years that she really believes that children should have information from an early age um, so that they understand um, you know, that their body belongs to them and what to do in the event that someone is um, touching them inappropriately or sexually abusing them. So her advocacy started in Illinois, her home state, and uh, many states have adopted what is known now nationally as Aaron's Law or Aaron Marin's Law. Um, here in West Virginia, uh, it, the impetus was different. Um, it was uh, not her, uh, well she did come to West Virginia, but actually some survivors of child sexual abuse uh, began to advocate for its passage here because their um, experience was similar, that they grew up and they didn't know who they could tell. Or maybe they did tell an adult, but that adult didn't report to the authorities, and so they were left in a, a situation for years. So before we go into some of the recommendations of this task force, we want to introduce a young woman who spoke to us in our I'd Like to Know segment, where we ask viewers to share the questions that they have of lawmakers and policymakers. Here's a student from High Rocks Academy in Pocahontas County. Hi, I'm Marlo Bogart, I'm from Rennick Greenbrier County, and I think that we don't have enough support for victims of mentally, physically, and sexually abused victims. So I'd like to know, how will you help me and many more victims in Rennick, Greenbrier County, and West Virginia to get the support they need? So what struck me about this young woman is how poised and self-controlled that she is, even though she's walking around with this history of suppressed trauma, which she knows that she needs help, and she knows other needs help, needs help with this as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I definitely want to get into some of the recommendations of your task force as well. Uh, let's go over the five recommendations. Now, number one is requiring training for all public school employees and strongly recommending training for youth services and faith-based organizations, staff volunteers. What should this training focus on? Um, so we really uh, encourage the training to be uh, uh, specific to two things. So the, rec the recommendation you're referencing really focuses on adults. So we have a whole portion on adult responsibility. Many times um, the focus of efforts like this has been on children. So what do you do if you're a child and you experience this? And yet we know that children are very vulnerable and cannot protect themselves. Um, so uh, this specific recommendation, we put it first because we do believe that adult responsibility is critically important. Um, so some of the tough conversations 
um, you know, we did a lot of querying of teachers organizations and teachers themselves and administrators. And many of them said, yeah, this did happen. Um, I did have a child come to me to disclose and I didn't know how to respond. I really wanted to be able to better support them, um, but I didn't know what to do. Or even, you know, some, some folks said, you know, I witnessed a behavior that I felt was inappropriate but I was just confused. I wasn't sure what to do next. And so some of those are complex issues. Um, so minimally, we certainly want adults to be aware of what are the signs and the behaviors that a child might exhibit if they're being sexually abused, but also what are things that institutions and youth-serving organizations can do so that they are better prepared through their policies and procedures to make sure that abuse never happens in the first place. And let's run through the, the next the next three really quickly mm -hmm. as well. The second step is simplifying and clarifying current mandatory reporting laws. What is there now and where does it become too complicated or cumbersome to use? Yeah, so um, we have a list of mandatory reporters, which we have had for a long time. But um, you know, f over the last several years, we've had specific situations pop up, like the um, Jerry Sandusky situation in Pennsylvania, um, where we know that there were people who had concerns that reported up, but that it was um, never reported to the authorities, and so many, many more children were at risk. So there was a law passed for that. And then there was a law passed about abuse in schools. And what has happened is over the years, there have become a, a huge set of um, different timelines and circumstances, so it's very difficult to understand. Um, so we really are focusing on streamlining that, so it's very easy to understand. You know if you're a mandated reporter. If you are a mandated reporter, what do you do? And clarifying that if you report to your superior or an administrator, that doesn't add abdicate your responsibility as a reporter to make sure that that gets to the authorities. And the third step is strengthening non-criminal sanctions for offenders. What might those look like? Um, you know, we looked at several different things, um, as licensure boards and how uh, different uh, types of complaints were handled. Um, so we have a lot of exploratory language actually under this recommendation because, um, you know, what we found is we need to do a lot more digging and to make sure that the different licensure boards have really um, strong approaches uh, to making sure that if somebody is committing an offense that is of concern, especially um, if there are allegations, you know, that they have had misconduct with children may not rise to a criminal level. What are we doing through our other um, systems to make sure that that person doesn't just get fired, go to a new place, and then offend again? And the next two steps, um, the fourth step is it gets a little bit tougher, or at least it takes a sustained effort among multiple parties. Mm -hmm. And that's collaborating and coordinating to leverage resources and identify strategies. And the fifth one regards um, education. Mm -hmm. So strengthening our school's capacity to provide age-appropriate and comprehensive evidence-based um, child sexual abuse prevention education, obviously to protect and empower children. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and the last recommendation, you know, we do always stress that that's very, uh, it, that's, it's utilized in many counties currently. It's just that it's not standardized, and so we believe that it shouldn't uh, be a child in Wyoming County doesn't have access to the same information to protect him or herself as a child in Raleigh County, that just one county away. And we really believe that all children need um, developmentally appropriate, age sensitive information um, that helps them to recognize what do I do if something like this is happening to me. And there are currently two bills that are being proposed right now, um, which just came out of bill drafting on mm -hmm. Friday. There's House Bill 4402 and Senate Bill 465. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly break those down and what they do? Yeah, so um, 4402 is the um, bill that's focused really on the education component. So the recommendation that's related to adult education and also child empowerment. So recommendations one and five. And it asks the um, Board of Education to promulgate rules um, that would really outline how is this going to look in schools. So um, we, we make it a requirement, but then we have a lot of flexibility, so there's local autonomy, but we make sure that there's a set of core components that really exist for every child in West Virginia and also every public school employee. So that's 4402, and we anticipate that actually to be on the education agenda on Wednesday this week. Um, and then the other bill is the mandatory reporting, the, the piece about streamlining and clarifying that set of requirements, because we want 
folks in the position, when, a, when they're in a position of trust with a child, to have a clear understanding, what is it that I'm supposed to do? Um, and so um, that has been introduced on the Senate side. Um, and uh, Senator Charles Trump, who is the chair of judiciary, is the lead sponsor of that bill. And um, we anticipate strong support for that as well. So do these bills go far enough in your mind? Well, they're a great first step. Um, certainly the recommendations are very extensive and we think that this will be a multi-year effort. Uh, the great thing about the task force is we had such a diverse group of stakeholders at the table, from the teachers unions to school administrators to the school board, advocacy organizations, the state police, prosecutors. So we had all the right people at the table and I think um, we developed a really strong consensus and it's going to require a lot of work, but it's work that we're all committed to. So you said it's a good first step. Where do we go from here? You know, um, I, I, once the bills pass, which we certainly are hopeful that they will this session, uh, then comes some really hard work. We want to take a look at maybe some pilot communities so we can see how is this best implemented, the education piece in the school systems. Um, we also really want to dig into those questions about licensure and how can we strengthen non-criminal protections, um, you know, so that children aren't subject to uh, you know, sort of the pass the trash notion. So you've got somebody who commits an offense in one place and moves school systems and then commits it there. We want to make sure that those things are handled so that it will require further research and study. Um, and so really, uh, this is going to be a multi-year sustained effort, but I feel very optimistic about it. Well, we'll definitely be following these bills and a lot more. Emily Chittenden, Laird, Executive Director of the West Virginia Child Advocacy Network. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Next, it's pro-life day at the state capitol, and many lawmakers were seen walking around with a red rose boutonniere in support. Leadership in both houses were presented with petitions signed by those who support the effort to eliminate Medicaid funding for abortions, except in extreme circumstances. The House Health Committee has already passed and sent to the Judiciary Committee House Bill 4012. The bill prevents Medicaid from paying for abortions unless that procedure is necessary to save the life of the mother. A similar bill, Senate Bill 417, is pending in the Senate. But at a public hearing this morning, speakers were overall four to one against the elimination of Medicaid-funded abortions. Here's an excerpt. I know we all share a determination to prevent unwanted pregnancies. We share compassion for every human life. I believe House Bill 4012 does not represent a faith-driven response to a social crisis, but exercises magical thinking in, about its solution. We all wish for the best possible um, chance that every child conceived will not only be wanted, but that every pregnant woman will be healthy, informed, and prepared to deliver that child in the best and safest of circumstances. It's wishful thinking to assume that this is always the case. It is misguided, magical thinking to believe that we will achieve these outcomes by punitive measures, restricting options, punishing doctors, and forcing poor women in medical distress to risk their lives or wind up poorer and more desperate in the attempt to end a dangerous pregnancy. House Bill 4012 will not achieve the positive outcomes you wish for. Thank you. Abortion is not health care, and it does not benefit women. Abortion has lifelong consequences, both mentally and physically, for those of us who've made these decisions. The federal legislation, the federal law that restricts funding of abortion, the Hyde Amendment, is attributed to saving two million people. Two million people are alive today because of that law. For you see, this bill only impacts poor and working class women. It has no effect on rich women. Under HB 4012, only poor and working class women have their access to abortion services curtailed. Mm -hmm. Only poor and working class women would be forced to beg in order to be able to exercise their fundamental right to terminate a pregnancy. And only poor and working class women have the very dignity of their basic bodily autonomy questioned. West Virginia is not only beautiful, it's family focused, and most of all, it's pro-life. And I am so blessed to be here because I know how much abortion can hurt women. I have various friends who have had abortions. Um, one who had an abortion on January 17th many years ago, and every year she suffers on that day and remembers her child and just cries, takes off work. And I don't want that for anyone. Now you demand that women continue unintended pregnancies, deny them bodily integrity, to pander to the demands of right-wing anti-abortion 
extremists who also, by the way, oppose birth control. I understand that the official motto of the state of West Virginia is, mountaineers are always free. Apparently, your actions call for a modification. Perhaps it should read, mountaineers are always free unless you are a poor woman seeking safe, legal abortion care to end an unintended pregnancy. I seriously don't know what it's like to be a pregnant woman. I bet it's very scary, especially if you can't afford it. But I do know that I was given a chance and these babies should too. This is really important, not just to me, but to the unborn. Um, to finish off, it is our duty to defend the sanctity of life, not just as American constituents, but as already born human beings. My name is Rosemary Winland, and I had an abortion. I had a uh, fetus who suffered a polypoloidy. It had an abundance of extra genetic material. Therefore, it was pretty big and very malformed. For whatever reason, um, my body did not spontaneously abort, as is typically the case in these situations. I carried the child to about 20 weeks before the condition was uh, illuminated to me. And an abortion was recommended at that time for emotional reasons. It was considered compassionate. I was glad for that opportunity. I was a young student. House Bill 4012, which would eliminate Medicaid funding of abortions, is currently in the House Judiciary Committee. According to the DHHR, 1,560 Medicaid-funded abortions were performed in West Virginia during fiscal year 2017, coming in at a cost of nearly $330,000. Data from 2013 shows there were 502 cases at a cost of nearly $280,000. In a related matter, a Senate joint resolution declaring that nothing in the state constitution protects the right to an abortion or requires the funding of the procedure unanimously passed the Senate Judiciary Committee late this afternoon on a voice vote. The measure now heads to the Senate floor. If adopted by a two-thirds majority in both chambers of the legislature, SJR 12 would go to the vote of the general public to ratify it as a constitutional amendment on the November ballot. Next, a question from another High Rock student. We hear now from Heidi Kelly. Hi, my name is Heidi Kelly, and I'm from Pocahontas County, West Virginia. And I think that cyberbullying is a big part of our society today and is leading to self-harm, suicidal thoughts, and more. And I would like to know what the state legislator is doing to help this problem. Heidi, we can report just today in the House of Delegates Committee, substitute for House Bill 2655 passed overwhelmingly. The bill defines cyberbullying in multiple forms as a crime and establishes a criminal penalty. Delegate Jill Upson spoke on behalf of the bill. You may proceed. This bill is about child safety. Grace McComas was a beautiful and vibrant 15-year-old high school sophomore for nearly an entire year. She was the target of hate speech, threats, and online bullying. Although Grace herself did not have a Twitter account, the popular social media platform was used to torment and humiliate her amongst her peers. On Easter Sunday, 2012, Grace committed suicide. Grace's mother, Christine Feister McComas, forwarded the following letter to me. Dear West Virginia legislators, five and a half years ago, our world stopped turning. The lives of our family and friends changed forever, and the world became more dim with the loss of our beloved daughter, Grace McComas. She died on Easter Sunday, attempting to flee the pain inflicted upon her by multiple people and entities. Grace was a wonderful human being. She was well-loved, she was active, she was well-adjusted, funny, exuberantly happy, tender-hearted, kind-hearted, too tender-hearted, in fact, in a world which can be cruel. 
According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, suicide rates for girls have doubled in the last decade, and cyberbullying is largely attributed. Victims of cyberbullying are more likely to use drugs and alcohol, to skip school, to get bad grades, and to have low self-esteem. Quote, this is why the West Virginia PTA supports this bill. Until this legislation is passed, we are not doing our due diligence to make sure that our children are protected and given their rights of a quality education. That will do it for the legislature today. Join us tomorrow night for an update of several issues and bills we've been following throughout the session, including the growing anger among public employees over the rising cost of their health insurance. And remember, you can watch the floor sessions live starting at 11 a.m. on the West Virginia channel. I'm Andrea Lanham for West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Thanks for joining us and have a great evening.